tires again. Yep, there you go. Hi, my name is Ron Hood and welcome to Volume 10 of the Woods Master Series where we teach you to be the Woods Master. In this volume of the Woods Master, we're going to be taking you into the mountains of Idaho to show you how to apply the skills that you've learned in the other Woods Master videos. That's why we call this particular video Survival Camping. But why do we call it that? Well, you see, in Survival Camping, what we've done is put together something like a little parachute or a a safety box or whatever you want to call it but something that will help you along in case there's a real emergency while you're testing your skills. This could be a sleeping bag and a little bit of extra food. It could be a lot of things. But in this video what we've done is we've taken a group of 12 folks who learned their skills from the Woods Master series into the woods on a survival trip and each of them gets to carry a little safety pack. There's something else that you need to know. When you see the folks in this video, you're going to look at those packs and say, golly, they got a lot of stuff. Well, I guess in some ways they do. But those packs are mostly filled with pieces of gear that these folks wanted to test out. You're going to see that in my own gear. I carry about 30 pounds of knives with me. Lots of stuff that needs to be tested. And you know what? Survival camping is the ideal chance for you to test the lightweight gear. There may be three or four pieces of that lightweight gear, but it's a chance for you to test it all out and see if it works. Well, was there any challenge to this kind of a trip? You betcha. You see, we only allowed one MRE per day. Meals ready to eat or meals rejected by everyone. You call it what you want, but it's pretty nasty chow. Each person got one of those per day, and they also get eight breakfast bars and as much coffee as they want to drink. So how's that? So you can see now what we're looking at is probably about 800 calories per day in the food they get to carry in and I'm guaranteeing they're going to be burning three to 4,000 calories per day on the trail. Well, that's what you got. So let's get started. The first thing I wanted to do is talk about the clothing that was allowed on the trip. And I've got a little stack here that represents pretty much what everybody was allowed to take. Of course, you get to have a belt along. I, I like this kind of belt here because it's got a money uh, place in it here, a little money belt thing. And of course, it's good and strong. Then I have... Um, a little bandana. Everybody's allowed to take three of these things. This is not only a bandana, but it's also what we call the ass rag. Uh, nobody's allowed to take toilet paper on these trips. We only have these rags. Of course, the key is to make sure that um, you don't confuse your ass rag with your bandana. Uh, the next thing is the pants. Now, I don't use very much cotton at all on trips like this because cotton can kill. Once it gets cold, it stays cold. But these pants here are nylon, and you can see they have a they're a, a zip-off kind of pants. So not only are they a pair of long pants, tight weave nylon, but they're also my shorts. If I need shorts, just zip off the uh, the legs. They're allowed a t-shirt, a long sleeve shirt of some kind. This one here is again a, a nylon blend, and uh, very comfortable. Lots of pockets. Then they're allowed a long sleeve shirt made of fleece. This is a kind of a your heavyweight insulation garment. This particular one has a little hood on it, but it's a fleece garment and very warm uh, even when it's wet. Did I mention a hat? Get a hat. And the last thing is a shell garment of some kind. This is a windbreaker. This cuts the uh, heat loss through convection. So when you put all these clothes on, you've got quite a bit here. And not much of it goes in your pack. Most of the stuff is, is stuff that you get to wear on the trail. So there you have it. That's it for clothes. The knife is your primary tool in survival and I brought along a few of them. Now, a lot of these are for testing. I wanted to find out how they perform and, um, and what I could do with them. First thing I'd like to show you is a little thing here called the Fire Genie. This is made by Rick Palm and uh, Rick is one of the folks in this, uh, in this group. But it's a little blade here with some serrations on it and uh, a fire striker that's held right here at the top of the tool. So you can wear that around your neck and you've always got a way to start a fire that way. And it looks kind of cool. I like it. So that's one thing. Now the primary tool that I would take if, if I just had one knife would probably be this one here. This is my Swiss Army knife with the saw and so forth. And you've seen this at work in all of the videos. 
Something else I brought along was the ATAX. This is our, our new tool when we designed it being made for us by TOPS. And uh, this thing's been in production, or not in production, but rather in development for quite a long time now. And we're down to the final strokes on that. Wanted to make sure that we had the, the thing in operating condition and all the parts and pieces worked well and everybody liked it. And they did. So we have the ATAX along with us. Now, that's not the only TOPS knife I brought. I also brought this little guy here. It's called the Mountain Hunter. It's an A2 steel knife that they make. It's great for skinning. It's great for carving. It's a durable little knife made on quarter inch stock. Beautiful like all of the work that, uh, that they do over there at Tops. I also have their little street scalper. This one here. Now this little knife is crazy. This thing is so tough. Uh, I use it for anything where I need to really brutalize something. But it attaches to the bottom of my ATAX. Something like this. Now, <clears throat> I wanted to do some other testing, and one of the things I wanted to test along on this trip were the knives that were made for me in Volume 9 of the series. This one here is made by Tim Lively, and it was made out of a pickup truck spring, and you saw it being made right there in the video. And I really wanted to try out a hammer forge knife and see how she worked. Well, this little guy was great. It's still got the original edge on it, sharp as a razor, and really held up great. I love that little knife. Easy to carry. It's accessible. God, nice. And here's one made for me by Tai Gu. This makes a pretty respectable little chopper. It also is a hammer forge spring and um, by golly this little sucker was pretty tough too. And I, I'm very pleased with both of the hammer forge knives. I also brought along a, uh, a little talonite blade here. It's a little skeleton blade made by Rob Simonich. And it's just a little test piece that I was uh, taking along. But uh, it's a, boy, it, it holds an edge too. <laughs> You might wonder how I could dull all these knives. Well, I really can't. Yeah, as much as I use everything, this is a lot of knives to work with. And finally, in my pack, I carried along my Anaconda. I've had this thing for a couple of years now, and it's been through a lot with me, and I just don't leave home without it any longer. So those are the blades that I carried on this trip, and you can say, well, that's more than you need. And you know what? You're right. It's a lot more than I need. But I wanted them, so I carried them. This here is my food pack. I put all my food into a little uh, day pack and then I strap that on the outside of my load bearing vest which you'll see in just a minute. But everything fits in here. Right now there's not very much in here. <clears throat> just a couple of MREs and uh, that's about the extent of it. But when it's filled with food with those darn MREs, boy this sucker is big. But you see it has compression bands on it here to bring it down to make it smaller so it'll fit smaller and smaller spaces as I go through the food. So I carry my food that way. Now I keep mentioning MREs. Uh, this is an MRE here. If you haven't seen one before, there are a lot of different manufacturers for them and they come packaged like so. They're kind of bulky. This is just one meal. But it contains a lot of different items and um, they look something like this. This one here happens to have uh, chickens, vegetables, and noodles and sauce. Mmm, -mm, yummy. It's also got some uh, crackers and a chocolate chip cookie and peanut butter and some iced tea and fork and spoon and then of course you got a little dessert this one is apple sliced apple slices and spiced sauce Ugh. well anyway that's what it looks like you can see there's a lot of packaging here this is what the actual MRE entree looks like now I've noticed over the years that a lot of people when they're going to eat them slice it across the top and then try to reach way down in the bottom to get their food if you're the kind that does that let me show you something here just shake that puppy up a little bit. By the way, I don't feel badly about wasting one of these. I'm sure not going to eat it. There we go. Just slice the top off like so. And, oh, geez, there it is. Ready to eat. I think the dogs will turn their heads at this one. I think next year we'll just bring dog food, go right to the source. The last thing, something that I really like, and you'll see a lot more of shortly, is bannock. I allow everybody to bring one pound of bannock with them on a trip. So Karen carries a pound, I carry a pound, and everybody else does too. And you'll see some uses for this stuff. It's really wonderful food. So that's what we do on the chow ran end. Here's some other stuff you're going to see in the video that I carry on these trips. One of these is about 15 feet of uh, one inch uh, tubular webbing, a carabiner, and then about 25 feet of, I think this is about six millimeter cord. These are like emergency things if I need to, uh, to lift something heavy and you'll see it being used in that way, uh, I've got this stuff available. 
So I always carry that with me. It adds a little bulk, but uh, there's a lot of uh, usability and flexibility with this. You're also going to see this little bag hanging around my neck from time to time. And this is our camera gear. We keep it all packed in here, and along with batteries and so forth. And when it's all loaded up, it probably weighs in around uh, 15 pounds or so. It's a pretty good load. But it all fits in that little container there. So now let's get on to the big thing. This is how I carry my load. It's called a load-bearing vest. Now you can see right on top is a little handgun in case we run into something cantankerous that needs adjusting. It's also okay for hunting if you want a, uh, a lot of little pieces of rabbit. Now the vest itself has lots of pockets on it as you probably can see. But let's start with the pockets on the back first. Down here in this big pouch, this is where I keep my tube tent and my blankets. I have uh, two um, poncho liner blankets. You'll see those later on in the video. But I keep both of those in here. This is actually large enough for a small sleeping bag. Then there are these three longer pockets up here. Let me show you a little bit about those. Uh, the first one that you see here is where I keep my water and my cooking. Basically, you've seen this before in volume three. We've got a one pound coffee can. This is what I do my cooking in. And then I've got my one quart wide mouth plastic bottle. And you can see it's wrapped at the top here with about two feet of duct tape. You never know when you might need some tape. I've also drilled the end out and I put in a little piece of, uh, of tubing here so I could drink while I'm on the trail. You can get this tubing at any of the uh, uh, supply houses that uh, handle um, fish and so forth. They have little valves for it and everything. It's very inexpensive. I think this is about 15 cents worth of tubing and a 15 cent valve. Not very much and it lasts forever. But that all fits right in there like that. Nice compact package <clears throat> and then slides down into the pocket. The next pocket over contains even more stuff. I'll try to bring this out of the package. What I've got here is my coffee cup. That's absolutely essential in the morning. Without the coffee cup, we're in trouble. Inside of that is my poncho. Just rolls up like so. This is a standard poncho. Rolls right up and it fits inside this other silver doodad here. Well, what is this? This is my little stove. I carry along some of these things here, these are called trioxane fuel tablets. And one of these will burn for, oh, about three minutes or so. And they burn very, very hot, They're very easy to ignite. I carry about 20 of these along with me. Now, why would I carry them? Well, one thing is if we have to start a fire and it's raining like crazy out, I can always ignite these and this will start a fire. It's going to burn very hot, as I say, for about three minutes. So that will light your fire. If I want to, when I wake up in the morning and I'm anxious for that first cup of coffee, I can just toss a couple of these in the bottom of our my little doodad here and set my can on top and heat up the water. It takes about, uh, say about four minutes to heat a quart of water to coffee temperature and uh, that's about all I can stand once I wake up. So there you go there. Now, those little trioxane fuel tablets are just about everywhere in this pack. On this side over here, I carry my trash bags and then I have a little first aid kit here. This is a, a more advanced first aid kit with some salves and so forth. So that's the back of the pack. Now let's take a look at the front. These six pockets down at the bottom of the vest are the, are the pockets that I use the most. They have the things in there that I need quickest and, uh, and most frequently. Uh, for instance, I have my mini kit in here. I have my water purification iodine, which you saw in volume three. Um, I have some lip salves pocket next to it is pretty much the navigation and information pocket. What I've got in here is a little AM FM radio. If we're out there and a big storm rolls in, it's good to be able to tune into a local station and get some sense of, of what might be approaching. Uh, I also keep my compass in here. There it is there. A notebook and a sharpening tool for my, uh, for my knives. And you can see how important that might be. And then down at the bottom I've got gum and some other odds and ends like that. Next pocket over, over is the GPS. This is very valuable these days. I just take it out and push the button one time and uh, that locks in my position on the GPS. It's pretty much just clunk like that. And it locks in where, I'm, where I am and from then on I can always get back to where I was no matter what happens. Next pocket over is observation gear. I have my binoculars buried in there. These are little 10 by 25 uh, binoculars. I think these are made by Minolta here. And uh, yeah, Minolta. 
really nice little binocular and very compact and lightweight. This is a food pack, believe it or not. <clears throat> it has just the essentials in it, and if I just pick the vest up with this in here, I'm good for three or four days. It doesn't seem like much, but you see it's got coffee. That's really important. Gotta have that coffee. It also has about 15 little food bars stuffed in there like so. And these are about 260 calories a piece, believe it or not. And so I just need a few of those each day, one in the morning, one or two in the morning with coffee, one in the middle of the afternoon, and then a couple at night for dinner. And that's it. That at least keeps me on the run. And then finally, over on the other end, I've got a space blanket. And I've also got another little kit with more mini kit components in it. So that handles the bottom pockets. You might also notice that I've got a lot of these little uh, kind of clip, clip rings here on things. And uh, these are handy in just a whole bunch of different ways. Now let's move up to the upper pockets. These are normally used for magazines for uh, handguns. And of course I keep one in one of these. But um, I also keep other odds and ends in here. Uh, uh, just stuff that I figure I might need along the trail. I don't know what's in here. Oh, I, I have batteries spare batteries for the GPS or the lights or whatever and, and that kind of sort of stuff but mainly one of these will be filled with a magazine. This is actually the first aid kit. This is the one that if there's an emergency I zip this baby open and I've got what I need. So when I zip it open if the emergency happens at night I've got a little flashlight. This little thing here called a Versabrite lasts about six hours on, um, on one set of eight AA batteries and uh, it's really a bright little flashlight. It kicks out a lot of light and it hooks right to my forehead. I don't have to put nails in the head or anything. It just kind of sticks on there. And I've got insect repellent and more coffee. Uh oh And a cutter kit for snake bite and so forth. A regular first aid kit and so forth. So that's that's kind of where I keep the emergency stuff. Finally I have one more flashlight in here. This is called a PAL light, and this is a, an LED light. It has um, three different modes. It has um, just off, of course. It, that's not a mode. It's just there. Then a low bright, a high bright, and then in the third position, uh, it flashes every once in a while. So I can set this up, and it'll flash. This will actually flash for about three months in that mode. How long does the, uh, the battery last? Well, it's one 9-volt battery, and it's good for a couple of weeks constantly on like that which is pretty amazing. So I've got one light that's good forever and takes a lot of shock and it's also uh, pretty watertight. One more thing I keep on here is a little photon light. This is just clipped right onto the uh, zipper on my emergency pack here so I always know where there's at least one light. Even in the middle of the night I can reach over, grab my vest and push that on and then I could find the real flashlight. So that's the stuff in the pockets on here. You'll see other odds and ends uh, clipped on here. I've got a couple of carabiners and I've got an extra watch and and all that sort of thing. But I do like to carry my load this way. It keeps it straight down on my shoulders and that leaves my hands free to move and uh, if I want to get a little more comfort I just unzip it a little bit. And something else about using this kind of vest, it has all these little snap spots on it here. And these little snaps will allow you to put in insulating panels if you want to. Of course I don't carry those but you can snap those in. You can also snap on sleeves if you want. And then it's got an interior pocket here where if you wanted to you could put a water bladder in there. Or if you're really afraid of somebody shooting you, you could put a ballistic panel in there and it'll protect you from a gunshot in that area. I don't think I need that much, but there you go. So that's how I carry my gear. I think it's about time for us to get moving here. What do you think? Earlier I mentioned that uh, we allow the use of Bannock on our trips. We use Bannock because it's easy to make, it's nutritious, it's inexpensive, and it works well. It's very flexible. So let's go visit Karen in the kitchen and see how to make this nutritious and fun chow. Hi, I'm Karen Hood, and I'm going to show you how to make a Bannock. Bannock is a really versatile food that we are allowed to bring up with us. Uh, to supplement our calorie intake for the day. In addition to eating one MRE per person per day, we are allowed to eat Bannock. You can eat it in the morning, the afternoon, or for dinner. 
And I guess the, the, the prepared product that is most similar to Bannock would be Bisquick. But this is a lot, uh, tastes a lot better. You can uh, add more fat to it if you want to. And uh, it is more nutritious and has more calories. So, let me show you how to make Bannock. Here's the ingredients for your basic recipe for Bannock. You have one cup of flour, a teaspoon of baking powder, a quarter teaspoon of salt, three tablespoons of margarine. You can add a little bit more margarine if you want a little bit more calories or more fat in your, in your recipe. And uh, optional is two tablespoons of skim milk powder. This just gives it a better consistency and it adds a little bit of flavor and a, little, uh, a few more calories. Now what we're going to do is we're going to sift all of these together. Now I am using uh, white flour. You can substitute um, for this white flour, you can substitute uh, whole wheat flour or uh, any other kind of flour that you want, anything that you prefer. So we're going to sift all these together. I need to get a spoon of the baking powder in there too. We're going to sift all the dry ingredients together into a mixing bowl. You can mix this by hand, but I'm going to use my mixer. Um, I'm going to use that anyway. That milk is just not, it's too big to get through that sifter, and I know it's not going to get clumped up because I've done it before. So, All right. What we're going to do is we're going to add our butter, three, tra three tablespoons of butter in this instance. I usually add a little bit more, but, but uh, this time I'm just going to use the three tablespoons. I'm using margarine in this recipe. I prefer to use margarine because it doesn't go rancid as quickly as butter and it's more pliable in colder temperatures. But, like a lot of people, I call margarine butter and butter margarine. So, if I do that, you'll know I'm talking about margarine in this particular recipe. And, I can't get this on here. <laughs> now that I have the mixture all in here, we're going to start it off on low speed. And we're going to keep it there, and we're going to keep it there until uh, the margarine gets mixed in, and the consistency, it takes quite a while, the consistency is going to be like granules of um, sand. So we're just going to let this continue to go until it's ready. Just around the edges so you got to stop it. And Clean off the edges and start again. Okay, this looks like it's just about done. It's the consistency of sand. And I'll show that to you right now. It's a little sandy. And because that fat is mixed in there so well, you can see that you can actually form it together a little bit. This is going to make a good dough when you get up there. Now what we're going to do is add this to a Ziploc. And on my Ziplocs, I, I like to carry these in Ziplocs because it's easy to, you can fold them and just stuff it in your pack any way you want. I like to put Bannock on the outside of it. Another thing that I like to do is if I have some specific recipes that I want, um, I want while I'm up there, I'll put the recipe and just write it right on the Ziploc. So we're just going to add this Bannock to the Ziploc. This makes about a pound. This recipe makes about a pound of Bannock. And for this trip, this was enough for Ron and I to share on the trip. So you can take this for yourself if you like Bannock a lot, or this is good enough for two people. Now you're going to see a lot of uses for this Bannock coming up in this video. It's a really versatile, versatile food, and it tastes great.
sunny outside. <laughs> Sweet under that with a hard little rough core. That's peachy. That's perfect. I like that. I have That's guy. what I told them Georgians when I went down to Atlanta there. Perfect. For the blade show a couple weeks ago. Yeah, what'd they say? That's a good as description as they ever heard. That's yeah. So you guys are into these peaches down there. <laughs> We've done that. <laughs> Skin them all the way down to the smile, you know. <laughs> So, um... <laughs>
As we were traveling towards our second night's camp, we scanned the ground for materials we could use. We rounded a bend and we found a true treasure, the rotting carcass of an elk. The water was just above freezing, but the treasure was well worth the effort and pain, materials, and amusement. When we finally dragged the carcass out of the water, it became evident that the animal had been a lion kill. How it managed to fall in the water is still a mystery. Ooh, are you going to eat it? What's that? I'll bite you. The elk had a special odor to it. Anything that's been decomposing in water for a week is pretty rough to handle. Still, despite the odor, it represented a huge opportunity for us to obtain materials. Joe volunteered to help handle the nasty load despite the fact that he had a sensitive stomach. He also explained to us that he wanted to overcome that sensitivity. Eric decided to administer an unusual form of therapy. <laughs> that's wonderful. Eric, that's, that's brilliant. <laughs> that doesn't smell too Hey, let's bad. see that one. Hold that one still for a minute. That's beautiful. That is wonderful. Now, Joe. Yes. How do those pictures make you feel? Posterity. There we go. Oh, there we go. Oh, oh my <laughs> God! Woo! Joe Barf, yeah. After Joe's performance, we had lunch and continued with our grisly task. Hey, success! Keep the tube screen. Let's get this elk out and get some hide off it. There's plenty of things we can use it for on this trip. The hide's still pretty good. As you can see, you can just peel this uh, hair off, and that's perfect, actually. Uh, when I brain tan at home, I soak them so the hair will slip like that on purpose. And uh, we tried to cut a little piece of hide off and dried it, and it's plenty tough. So there's a lot of great raw hide, and uh, if uh, there's any good brains in the, in the head, we may even have some brain tanned elk before this trip is over. This is kind of a big knife to be skinning with, but it'll work. What knife are you using? Uh, this is uh, one I made just for this trip. Finished it about, oh, three hours <laughs> before I left on this trip. It's called the SRT Trail Knife. It's, uh, it's one that I offer all the time. If some guys are smart, they'll come down and get some sinews. A lot of good sinew in the leg and along the backbone, but I don't think there's going to be any left on the backbone. We can take these hooves and these uh, dew claws here, take them back to camp, and along with some rawhide, after we've dried it, you can boil it down with a little water and it makes very good hide glue. Very strong. Not right. waterproof, but very strong glue. Great. So this was really a good find, this elk. Right. Elk have two unusual teeth called ivories. I have no idea what the function of these teeth is, but they constitute a prize and can be polished and used in jewelry, or they can be traded for amazing things like bubble gum and jet aircraft. As Rob had mentioned, the elk brain is used in brain tanning. Even though the carcass was rotting in the water, we had our hopes that the brain was still usable for tanning. I've never been able to understand just why my nose starts to itch just about the time my hands get covered with gore. It's part of the phenomena too that if a piece of slop gets airborne, it'll land in my mouth. That's the brain there, it's all. We're not gonna do any tanning with that. No. See how she's not gonna up. work? Yeah, it's gotta no. be kinda of that. <laughs> Each evening we sit around the campfire, work on our skills and tell tales. The distinction between reality and fiction begins to blur. You have a bone anvil there, hon? Yeah, I got a bone anvil here. I'm using this to work on. So. What you making? Well, I'm making a. This is actually a Gnox de Hagen. 
They're very similar to a Pweep Weeple, but they're a more modern design. Okay. We had a guy's name's Alan. His head turns red. I mean, be red. And he's running around, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And my friend Randy looks at him and goes, fondle my buttocks. <laughs> and Al just stops and looks at him and goes, what did he say? You heard him. And I'll tell you what, diffused Al, he had no idea what to do. He just wanders off muttering to himself. What we're doing here is we're cutting off a little disc of this uh, lodgepole pine to make a, a flywheel for a drill that we're going to make. Might as well go ahead there, buddy. This is a pocket chainsaw, it's called. And uh, it's trying to keep it nice and square so the, uh, the disc will spin through. It won't be too heavy on one side or the other. Once you get these chainsaws going, they work real well. You can see what Rob and I have done here is created a little holder so we don't have to get down in the wet grass and do our cutting down there. There you go. <coughs> One flywheel. Pretty square? That's pretty square, dude. Good job. What we have going on here is we've made a fire ring. We're going to build a nice sized fire in here. After the fire is good and hot, we've got lots of coals, we're going to go ahead and heat up a nail. And uh, we're going to bring it up to forging temperatures. Then we're going to take it over to this rock here, which is going to be our anvil, this big old rock here. And we're going to flatten one end of it and turn it into a little point by grinding it on stones. And that'll be a drill. Then we'll put that drill into a, another piece of wood, a little rod, that rod will fit into the disc that we just created and we'll be able to make a, um, a small hand drill. It'll actually be a pump drill, but you'll see more of that in a minute. About four days into the trip, the days started to cool down and we had a couple of sprinkles of light rain. The real challenge came at night when the temperatures were in the high teens. I'm going to start writing things down and I'm going to forget. <laughs> That's good. This little tool here is called a fencing plier. It's got a number of different tools on it. It's got a hammer face here. It's got a kind of like a regular plier right up in this area. Down in here we've got something to cut fence wire. This end here is like a nail remover. Ordinarily when you buy these things, this face here is kind of serrated. What I did is I simply ground that serration off to give us a smoother surface for hammering. I need a green stick to oh, cool. In order to accomplish some of our projects, we needed to make a drill bit. I had found a nail alongside the trail, so I set about smithing the nail into a drill. The idea caught on, and soon there were several drill bits and drive mechanisms in process. One of the pluses of smithing in the cool weather, it was warm near the fire. We found this nail here on the trail when we were walking in, and what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to make a drill out of it, and this is how I did it. I took this stick and I drilled a hole into it, well, actually with my awl in, on my Swiss Army knife, and then I took the nail with the head on it still, and hammered it in, and I clipped off the nail, and and this makes a handle so I can put the nail into the hot coals. When this nail got hot, I took it out and hammered it with the hammer here till it was flat on both sides, as you can see. Now what I'm doing is I'm taking a nice file here and I'm filing a point on it. And you can see how that's going to make a nice drill for us when I'm done. I'm not done yet, but it'll make a nice drill. There we go. You know what? I was doing it better one-handed. No comment, please. <laughs> it's working. Okay. Oh and you just cracked the rock. You Actually, I died rock. a little earlier. <laughs> Seems like the anaconda's holding it better than the rock. <laughs> now they call me lightning. I never hit the same place twice. About three more good solid hits. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's good. We're making a... Uh, Ultimately, a spindle drill. And this is what a spindle drill is. Is that you have a flywheel, a shaft, and twine. And uh, it's a little tough to see, 
But this is going to be a wooden platform that holds the twine out away from the spindle like that. When you push, it spins. And then as the flywheel catches it, it rewinds the other direction. This is going to be a flat piece of wood with a hole in the middle that moves down over this that the twine ties off to. You'll be able to see that a little later. This is the drill that Karen made. You can see she's flattened out the tip and sharpened the edges and stuck it down inside of the little drill here. Works like so. You'll see more of that in a minute. But what we're going to do now is we have to harden this nail. So in order to do that, we're going to plunge it through this piece of foil here like so and create like a little heat shield to protect the wood that's behind it. Just like that. Now we're going to put that into the fire and when it's cherry red I'm going to pull it out and just plunge it into a can of water that I've got waiting there. This little tool here is like a little multi-tool and you could do what I'm about to explain to any multi-tool. Basically what I did is I magnetized the tip so it's a little bit of a magnet and I use that to judge the temperature. You probably saw that in volume 9 uh, where they were using a magnet to test the wellness of a um, how hot something is. And there's no attraction between this metal so it's plenty hot now even though you can't see the color because of the daylight. I'm going to put it back in there and let it get hot again because it has to be hot enough. It'll only take a few moments because it's already pretty hot. So I think we'll go ahead and stick it in the water and see what happens to it. Okay, you might be able to see the, the bluish color that's in there. So this has been um, hardened now enough to be able to drill through bone. Now that Karen's built the spindle and attached the nail uh, and then flattened out the nail to make a, a drill bit, I hardened the thing and the next step is we cut a little slot right across the top of the spindle and set it up so it'll hold a piece of cordage about like so. Now this cordage is for your thumbs. Put one thumb in there, one thumb in like so, see there? And this makes it so you can keep downward pressure when you're drilling. What am I making? I'm gonna make a cutting this bare bone here to make a bellows for a uh, well for the bellows for the bellows we'll be making to uh, heat up the uh, metal that we'll be getting. So what you're making is a pipe to uh, carry the air from the that's bellows into the fire, is that correct? That's correct. Excellent. Why did you choose bone? Well, it's hollow, Find as you can see. Available. Makes a nice air passage. Probably fireproof, well, fire resistant too, isn't it? That's correct. Excellent. Each day a group would go out to forage for food and materials. Ooh. On this day, Rob and Rachel return with the that's makings again. for a small feast. I do. Not too good. A lot of hunting. One, one squirrel. Lots of blue camas. Wild onions. Enough for stew. Yeah, my coat will now forever smell like onions. What are those, Rachel? These are wild onions. And this is blue camas. Ooh. And this is a bottle. <laughs> Great. Good work. Well, I picked some dandelions and uh, dandelion greens, and I put some bouillon in there, chicken bouillon, and I'm Boiling them up for a quick snack. Mmm, yummy. This stuff is called blue camas, and uh, I get better, no uh, better known as Indian potato. There's another word for it, and the Indians really relied on this as a food source. And and uh, here up in these mountain valleys here, it's just loaded. If you can see out there areas of purple, well, it's all this purple flower. And you can take a digging stick out there and get you a pretty good meal in uh, not much time. It tastes a lot like a potato or a cattail root, uh, very starchy. And uh, one thing that uh, you don't want to do is uh, you don't want to eat anything without the blue flower. Uh, a yellow-white flower looks much the same, has the same kind of bulb. That's called, uh, uh, I guess locally would be called a death camas, and they will kill you. Uh, I've heard stories of whole Indian families getting very ill and some dying by uh, getting one bulb mixed up in a whole meal of uh, blue camas, so be very careful. If you have any questions, just leave the flowers on, and that way you know. Our earlier forging experiments drove us to search for more steel and better materials 
with which to make a real wilderness forge. When the guys returned, they had some real treasures. Oh, man. Where'd you guys find that? Camp. Um, over on the other side. Is there a cowboy camp over there? Yeah. Just oh, there yeah. The oh, my gosh. Yeah. There weren't any cowboys around here. Yeah, there yeah, were. Four <laughs> shirts and some real treasures. Mm. What's on the back there? Well, a I cup? Need, I needed a coffee cup, so <laughs> <laughs> I found this about two feet under. That's cool. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Something that's well seasoned. That's great. Oh, look at Whoa. That. Oh, my God. Oh, there's a wow. yeah. Right on. There's our forge. Sheesh. Good work. Let's give them a hand, you guys. Hey. Hi, Emma. We gathered up some stuff at a, at a cowboy camp. Uh, their refuse is our, uh, our resources. What are you making, Ron? Um, making a hole right now. The uh, uh, not quite sure what I'm making, uh, but I'm sure it's going to turn into something. You making a little squirrel soup there? And they're starting. Okay, what I was going to show is how to um, knock off the bottom of the bottle, which is good for arrowheads, but usually you break the bottle a little bit and it makes it difficult because you have to spend more time on it. But if you take a nail and you just sit it inside and you hop up and down and it takes off the bottom. Yeah. Come on. Well this one is not working. <laughs> Off. That's really good. Don't That's it clever. A beer one. Let me try the beer bottle one. Do it. it really does. <laughs> I believe it. We just... There it is. Perfect yes. cut. Good arrowhead. <laughs> Rick, you're just genius. Little, uh, little afternoon snack, I guess. Uh, <laughs> I think I'm out of tin foil. We're using used tin foil that we sure. burned in the fire already. Hey man, that's I don't, good. I don't want to waste any energy. Wow. Mm, yeah, that looks yeah. good. This is all the food I get all week, so I gotta <laughs> gotta make it uh, make it good. That's really good. You mean it? I'm not going to share, though. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like a midget eating this. <laughs> or a giant. Take your pick. <laughs> One of the real pleasures of survival camping <laughs> is the opportunity to sit around a fire with friends and make things. What are you doing under there? Okay. So I ended up impressed. I'm eating, I'm drinking tea. <laughs> I never drink tea. You would be impressed? She would be impressed. Who would? Hey, why is this My getting wife? longer? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh she's a tea drinker? Mm-hmm. My son, too. But not me. We needed to puncture some holes in this barrel, and the only good drill we had happened to be 45 caliber. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's exciting stuff. Good deal. A ventilated forge. Then deal. Draws from the bottom, fire in the middle. Okay, um, what I did is I, I took a piece of that uh, uh, elk and I soaked it overnight in a, uh, a bag full of urine. I've had to pee in a cup before, but never in a bag. Uh, now I rinsed it out, and I'm just uh, trying to stretch out this uh, this hide so I can make a nice piece of uh, piece.
piece of rawhide, hopefully make a little pouch out of it. I was surprised at how tough it is. I've got to use my awl to get a hole uh, poked through this stuff. It's, it's, it's surprisingly strong. I tried poking it just with a stick and couldn't do it. So I've, I've carved some small pegs and I'm just putting those through the holes when I can find them and uh, uh, trying to stretch it out a little bit so it'll, so it'll dry so I can so I can work with it. What we have here is a nice batch of uh, squirrel stew here mixed with uh, wild onions, uh, wild thistle, which tastes like celery, threw in a little bit of bowling and cube of Italian seasoning and some salt and pepper. So once this cools down, we shall chow down and... <laughs> Hi there. We're out here on the Hoodlum's June trip and we've run up this Forager's Forge using materials that we found in the field and materials that we had in our various mini and maxi kits. What we have here is we're heating up a horseshoe down in the coals. Now normally you couldn't get that hot enough to do really serious forging unless you could blow more air in there. So what we've done is we've taken uh, the materials we had at hand. One of them was that we found some bones laying where some uh, elk had dropped. And Joe and a few others had cut through these bones which are hollow in the middle. That provided a tube to pass the air through that can also uh, stand the high heat that's here next to the forge. We have one of those bones on this end right here. Now, what we did is that I've built a uh, forge, I uh, correction, I've built a bellows here that um, unfortunately being made of plastic can't be too close to the heat. So to locate it remotely, what we did was we tied together a trouser leg here to the end of the bone, another bone here to make sure that it doesn't collapse. That goes into the bag and gives us an airtight seal. Now this bellows design is probably thousands of years old. The principles are, are, uh, have been around about forever. But fundamentally, when we lift it like this, the air flows in to the inside of the bag. You close this, and that acts as a valve, and then you press, and that blows into the forge. A few of the finer points of building a for uh, bellows like this can be demonstrated here. When we open the valve, you'll notice that we had found some fiberglass that had been laying out along the side of the trail, and I made a hoop. And what that hoop does is that when I lift up to allow the air to go into the bag, it holds the bag open to allow more volume of air to go in. Otherwise, the bag would just flatten against itself and you wouldn't get any air. Then by putting the two sticks together and giving it a half twist, you have a very good vacuum seal, I mean air pressure seal here. And then all you do is just press down and lean on it. And this is a very effective, uh, very effective assembly. One more hint to make this work a little better for you is in the bottom, place, place a few rocks in the bottom of the bellows. And that way when you lift it up, the uh, bottom of the bellows will uh, remain on the ground and allow you to get the maximum volume of air. With a primitive forge and a horseshoe, we could fashion any of a number of tools. We could forge and harden the shoe to make a spear, a knife, a fire starting steel, a chisel, and more. Generally, however, it is smart to use the forge to first make more tools, which you will then use to satisfy your more sophisticated iron needs. Sweet. Not the other way, flip over. Good, good start. Okay, maybe flip her over and grab the other side. There you go. After working with the horseshoe for a short while, Rob decided to test one of the Nordus he had made by attempting to cut the red-hot horseshoe in half. 
Remember, this will void your warranty. <laughs> Whoa, there we go. Hold it, hold it. Two pieces of the scrap with your hand there. No, lay, lay that right down alongside it. Right down. What not to do with your knife? It's funny, it didn't do that much. The blade did it. No. It did a damn fine job on that app. Yeah. Steve got busy making a spoon by first carving the shape and then burning out the wood to make it smooth. What are you scraping it out with? Just a stick. I've been using a knife to scrape some of it out, but uh, once you once you charred, it comes out pretty easy. Well, anything will pull it out. Beautiful. <laughs> He's got his tail in the air and everything. Which one has his tail? At some point, Kuma decided that Eric was just the sort he'd been looking for. He likes you, Eric. What you doing? I am making a fishing pole. I found this piece of pine. It's dead and it's kind of hard. It's not too brittle. And I cut it off to the right length and I'm going to be finishing it pretty darn soon. Wow. Hi, Ron. How you doing? Pretty good. What do you got going on here? Well, I just, I made a body bag hammock earlier, and I, I think I'm going to spend the night in it tonight. Man, that's pretty slick. Yeah, it's very comfortable. This is luxury in the woods. I'll bet it is. Mind showing me how you made it? Oh, I'd love to. Let me hop out and I'll show you. What we you. have here is a standard issue uh, body bag from the US government. There's several types. This particular one happens to be a uh, single layer material and it's water repellent. They're made to actually cover bot or to carry bodies with. There's six straps, two on the corners and one in the middle for uh, people to hold on to. They're heavy duty uh, two inch webbing and there's a very heavy duty zipper in the middle used to zip it up with. So actually I've been use, using this to sleep in for the past several nights. On this trip you've allowed us to bring a, uh, a bivy sack or body bag, a cushion which I've got a thermarest air inflated cushion inside of this, and a poncho liner and a poncho. And that's all I've been sleeping with for the past uh, several nights and I got down to 19 degrees last night. Here's the poncho liner and I'll show this to you. It's just it's one layer thin material but uh, when you when you make your insulation properly around your body you stay quite warm. I've been warm for the past several days. One thing I forgot to mention about this setup, Ron, is that it's quickly transportable. So by the way that we've used the paracord on the perimeter of the body bag, we can easily take it down, roll it up, put it in our backpack, take it to the next camp, and depending on the distance of the two trees, quickly reassemble it. So that's one of the big advantages of using a hammock as we've designed it in this fashion.
now that I have it hung, I'd like to show you how the spreader bars work. Uh, you know, designed very simply, the cord just goes in two lengths, slides in just above the knot where we're holding the webbing, and then this cord stretches, and then you slide in the other side just above the webbing, and it locks in place, and the webbing will keep it spread apart. Now that you can see the spreader bars are in, uh, we're a little bit lopsided. The tension on this end is a little bit less than this end. Uh, actually, the problem is that this side has been stretched too much because we've been, uh, this is the side I've been getting in and out of. What we're going to do now is I'm going to show you how to, to uh, equalize the tension or take some of the tension, add tension to this side so that each side has equal pressure. These are the two pieces I'm going to use to uh, add tension to this side of the hammock. One is just a piece of stick, and another is a short piece of parachute cord. It's a little bit long, but any length will do. So the process is to add a twist into this side of the hammock support. So we've got a single twist here. It looks like I'm going to need about three or four turns to bring this up to the correct tension level. That looks to be equally tension, same tension on both sides. Now you just hold this together hold it to the line and we're just going to tie it down to the line. So I'm just going to wrap some parachute cord around here and then I'm just going to tie it off in a knot. So here we have the, the completed body bag hammock. I uh, just wanted to add one other note. Another reason for having the ropes other than to help suspend the weight of the hammock and keep it onto the webs is also to suspend some shelter. And here is my rain poncho which I'm going to toss over the top tonight to actually keep the moisture, condensation, and any potential rain off of me. Now it snaps in the bottoms around the corners and I'll secure it so it won't blow off but another helpful feature is uh, the top of it. You can tie the hood together and what I'm going to do is run a string between these two trees to pull this up so that the rain will run off to the sides and it won't puddle in the middle and this should be a very uh, suitable and comfortable shelter for tonight and I'm looking forward to it. I've got my hide. I'm trying to smoke it now. It's already been stretched and dried and I tried to scrape off most of the fat off of it. I um, uh, kind of rubbed it uh, around a tree to get the, uh, uh, the grain broken a little bit. We're going to smoke it now and then I'll be taking it down to the, uh, to the creek again find a nice uh, smooth uh, round stone and try and break up the grain by um, pounding, a, uh, pounding this, uh, this hide with a stone on some grass. Not everyone is able to tolerate the smell of a rotting skin. We learned earlier that Joe was particularly sensitive to the odor of decomposition. He tried to overcome his sensitivities, but it's not easy. I want to thank him for his good-natured attempts. Does that smell pretty bad? Oh, yeah. Oh. Well, do you think you'd be able to cut that piece of uh, skin off there? What skin? Just that wet piece there. Where? Uh, just, just reach right down there and grab it. <laughs> Are you okay, man? Oh, yeah. Maybe you better not do that job. <laughs> Might as well not. Okay, let's get out of here. This is just primo stuff. On the other hand, there are folks like Eric who attract dogs yeah. and who love the smell of rotting flesh. I wonder if there's a correlation. Okay. So you're, what, are you, what are you doing right now? Well, I'm going to uh, pick out a piece of hide here. I'm going to try to make a, a hoop drum, I guess you call it. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm going to make a hoop and stretch it over there and see if I can make a drum. Sounds good. So This is a piece of sinew from the leg of the elk we found dead the other day and sinew is an excellent source of cordage. I'm going to process it by stripping off all of the fat and material that we don't need and then process it by soaking it in urine for 24 hours. Soaking in the urine for 24 hours helps soften up the fat and soften up the tissue and the sinew 
so that it separates more easily. When we're done soaking, I'll take it out, take it down to the stream and wash it out real good and then we'll dry it in the shade until it's ready for further processing. It's been sitting out for a couple of days now so it's tough. Okay, I've uh, put the uh, pieces we want to make into cordage into a bag uh, with urine so it's ready to set overnight uh, for 24 hours so that we can uh, go to the next step in the processing. Okay, we've let this sinew sit in the urine for 24 hours or, and taken it out and washed it. It's uh, not been dried yet, but we wanted to show you that you could separate them while it's still wet. The advantage of letting it dry out is that there is still the natural glue in the tendon strands that uh, can be reactivated by using saliva. So when you twist the fibers together to make your cordage, you can use a little saliva and it makes a stronger cordage. You can still make cordage out of the wet uh, tendon, but it won't be quite as strong. And so I'll just uh, pound on this a little. We don't use a, uh, a rock because that could cut the tendons and we want the fibers to be as long as we can get them. Uh, you can see this is just a short piece so we'll need to splice as we go to make a, a lengthy piece of cordage. So we don't want to damage any and we don't want to make them any shorter than, than they already are so that we have minimal splicing. Now we should be able to start separate, separating out the fibers. And these individual fibers are what we will twist together with a reverse twist to make cordage that can be used for bow strings or any other applications you might have out here in the wilderness where you don't have any, any ready-made cordage available to you. This is a piece of tendon from the same elk that uh, was processed by Bill Qualls. Uh, it's already gone through the uh, urine soak and has been washed and was dried in the shade. So it's perfectly dry now and is ready to be uh, separated into strands. Wanted to show you the difference between this and doing it with the wet uh, tendon. You'll notice the uh, translucent color of this tendon that wasn't uh, noticeable in, in the wet tendon. So we'll just uh, work with it a little bit to make it a little easier to separate. And you can tell this is, this is much stiffer, but it's beginning to separate into the fine strands that you want. This is the finished fishing pole, and I wanted to show you, I'm just about ready to go fishing, I wanted to show you what I did to make it right before I go. Here's the reel that I packed in, and I attached that to the pole with some cable ties, and up here, I made some eye loops with uh, snare wire. I made three of them. Here's one, two, and the third one's up on top. And I found a feather, and um, I actually I had a hook, and I found a feather, and I made a um, a nice lure here to catch the fish with. Hopefully it'll work. <laughs> hey, Bill, what's going on there? Hi. We found this uh, this grill yesterday at one of the cowboy camps, and uh, I'm just using it as a hide stretcher. I, it's hard to find any good willow around here. All the willow is very small and uh, hard to make a nice uh, nice hoop. So I thought this would work just as well. Hi, what I have here is called a fig, uh, Paiute Figure Four trap. It is very similar to the Figure Four trap that you've seen in Volume Five of the Woodmaster series, except this one's a little bit modified and a little bit different. This is set up more so to trap quicker game like mice, squirrels, chipmunks, and weasels. Um, it has the same principles of the figure four except of the uh, different toggle and the uh, bait stick. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the different uh, components here 
and give you a general idea how it's set up. Figure four. We have the deadfall, which is supported by the disc diagonal stick, which most of the weight is resting on top of the uh, horizontal stick, as you've seen with the regular figure four. However, what we have here is the uh, trigger string, which is uh, basically tied to this end, which then, then is to connect to this toggle, which is wrapped around almost halfway. We have then the trigger stick, which basically is braced up against here and butt up against the end of this toggle. This trap is so sensitive that a mouse, just by touching it, would actually set it off. Well, since we're lacking iron in our diet, I set this trap up to catch this can. So let's just see how well this thing actually works. As you can see, it is very fast and very effective. Yesterday, a few of us went over to a cowboy camp and we were searching around for some items and uh, I came across a couple, a couple things I thought I could use to make smaller forge. I found a, I guess it's a Coleman fuel can. Cut a little groove here. I thought maybe if this thing works, I'd be able to set the tools down in there and heat them up that way. For there, I, I made a, a small tweer uh, type pipe where the original plastic spigot was. I just kind of popped that out. I, I noticed what appeared to be a bunch of clay, so I got down in there and dug a bunch of that out and I, I mixed it with a bunch of dry grass in hopes to make adobe type mixture here. What I did was uh, attached some surgical tubing from the Amaxi kit. I'm going to use this as a mouthpiece to blow uh, air into this. Okay, yesterday we started a, a pretty good sized fire in this, this forge and after we got it burning really hot and good, we smothered it with dirt. And the purpose of this is trying to make some charcoal. And I'm going to take some of this charcoal that we, we made and take it over to Eric's forge and let him use it in his. Put it in the fork. Sure. Put it out. My fellow blade forger in trouble. Eric, Eric, snap out of it, buddy. Snap out. <laughs> we can give you air. Ah. <laughs> now what's the trouble with this forge? Let's have a look. Dun dun dun. <laughs> this is ridiculous. Okay. I think we can adapt this. Starting to, uh, to work here. Yeah, I'm impressed. You did a tremendous job on that. With the help oh. of you, Billow Man, or well, I always have majored in hot air, and besides that, you were only near death. It's not like it was anything super dramatic. sack or whatever. You <laughs> now you're embarrassing me. <laughs> no, that's impressive. It's great. So you planning on packing this out, and bringing it back home as a souvenir, and make some blades at home? Well, since it's uh, going to work, possibly. <laughs> I mean, it's nice and portable, too. There's no reason you can't bring that camp to camp. Garrick had found a 9-inch spike during his foraging and used a portion of it in his forge. Look over there. That's impressive. <laughs> Oh, 
little baby. <laughs> Can I uh, borrow those pliers again? Yep, there you go. I think this one's going to be pretty red. Wow. <laughs> Well, let's check this puppy. Jeez, look at that. It's working. Oh, that's really that's working. Sweet Here. red. Growing. We've built this spindle drill out here, also known as a hand pump drill. And the way that the drill works is that uh, as these cables tighten up around the drill, it stores energy in the flywheel. When you push down, the flywheel continues to move and rewind itself for the next stroke. By doing this back and forth, as you can see, you can drill holes in bone, wood, whatever you need to, and it makes a fine hole, as a matter of fact. Drills like this are used in the third world. I have a, a kukuri at home, a large knife that's made, and the drilling through was done with a drill just like this. Tom's a lot better at this than I am, so Tom, if you could demonstrate. Sure, Ray. That kind of gives you the idea. It's very effective and very fast. Well, here's the reel I made. I found this uh, piece of fiberglass on the trailhead, right at the beginning of the trailhead. And I made eyelets out of uh, snare wire. And what I did is I took a little branch, a wide branch, cut it down, notched it out, so that I could attach it to it with uh, snare wire. And this is just the, the reel that I bought the fishing line on. And here's the fish. All right, a little Woodsmaster tip for you. It involves how to tie a little knot that you can jerk on all you want. It'll stay tight, and then when you're ready to leave, it comes right apart. This is just one way to do it. I've got a little loop on the end of this cord. Now what I'm going to do is pass the other end of the cord through so you can see it right in here. Next thing that you do is you pass your cord. This is sort of like a little half hitch over the top, like so and inside. Now what we got is something like a little bow knot. And if I pull real hard this thing will come apart. What locks it is you take the bow, the little big old loop here, and pass it around one more time. And don't tighten it up too much. And it makes that kind of a knot. Now watch this. I'll just go ahead and put some weight on it. And that should tighten up any regular knot. But looky here, this loop is still loose. I take the loose end, pull, and we're done. We're free. Hello everyone, I'm Radio Ray, here with another Woodsmaster tip. When you're walking long distances, you want to be able to use different muscle groups in different ways. For example, the Plainsman Stride, which we teach in one of the other tapes. Well, we've developed a new method here that's a Plainsman Stride, but it uses more of the muscles in your upper body. What you do is, is as you're walking down the trail to completely relax your muscles here, which burn a lot of energy, you can take your hand and grab your trousers roughly in front of where your knee is. And do that on both legs. And then as you walk, you can lift and place and lift and place and lift and place. And as amazing as it may seem, I'm not using any muscles in my legs at all.
Well, I've got a squirrel today, and um, let's see if we can bring him out so you can see him. Oh, he's fighting. Here it comes. And this squirrel, as unappetizing as it may look, is covered with Malaysian uh, curry and also a spice called garam masala. And uh, what I did was I braised it for about a half an hour to uh, really work the spice in. And then now I'm boiling it to basically uh, stew it and uh, break up some of the toughness. And the last thing I'll do is we have a lot of blue camas and dandelions and other things out here I'll put in there, mix in some more curry, a little bit of thickener, and we'll have squirrel curry. So, and this is also uh, one of the beginnings of my fire bed for my shelter. This is the finished product, the uh, bag that I made out of my, uh, uh, the elk skin. Uh, there's been a lot of work put into this bag. It was a lot of work. Um, in addition to stretching it, I had to scrape it uh, to get the extra fat off, uh, smoke it over a fire with, uh, with green, needle, green pine needles, and uh, pound it uh, with a smooth rock on the ground to break the grain up. Uh, it was a lot of work and I have stitched it. Um, I ended up using an easy all uh, to do that. I tried to form it so it was kind of box-like. Um, I put a little button out of a bone on it, um, a belt loop on the back, and I sized it to, uh, to fit my uh, canteen cup, because this is something I always like to take with me on all of my camping trips and survival trips. So the cup has a lot of sentimental value for me, so that's why I chose that. And I'm pleased with the finished product. Hello everyone, I'm Radio Ray. Made this bow today out of some material that's common just about everywhere, and that's willow. Basically what I did was take a section of willow that was about the size of my wrist, split it down sideways, and formed this flat bow. A flat bow is very, very good when you have questionable wood like uh, willow in that, uh, and frankly it works rather well. Let's string it up and see how it looks. Here we go. That's what you can do with a little bit of wood, your good knife, and a little bit of skill. Dump some beer in, make some bad ones. What are we doing here? We're going to make some donuts out of bannock. Yep. Bannock and some, some beer? beer. Yeah. Beer batter donuts. Beer batter. Hispanic donuts. Uh, where'd that beer come from? That's gonna be good. <laughs> the pack dogs brought that up. Oh, that's right. I love it too. We had Rob's idea to make donuts out of bannock was a great adaptation of the same notion Karen tried out in cave cooking too. Until Rob found the can of oil and started cooking, we'd been using bannock to thicken soups, make dumplings, make fry cakes, ash bread, and other goodies. You can't imagine how good donuts dipped in sugar taste after a diet of whitefish, squirrel, and MREs. That you cut the top off of? Yeah. Just took my knife and cut the top off and then I burnt it real good so there's no residue. Good. We just got to hope that that's uh, oil. <laughs> Oh, it is? Yeah, well, it still had seal on it. Wow. It had never been opened. Oh, that's cool. So we the whole thing? Yeah. So we just cracked it and uh, good. smelled it. Good. Good to go. Great. Good. Ready for some bannock donuts? Yeah. I can put a hot chocolate in it. Leave some mud. The oil that Rob found had been left behind in a hidden cache by some hunters. We often call these hunting camps cowboy camps, but the fact is the most of the stuff had been left by other campers or hunters. Some of the time the campers intend to come back and use what's left behind, but more often than not they forget. By the appearance of the container, this oil had been in the cache since the early 90s. This, this it pays good. to look it's for these like caches this. whenever it's possible. Well, in good condition, <laughs> unopened. It's bizarre. <laughs> Just to be on the safe side. 
Is that working, Rob? Does it look like it's done? Feels uh, like it. Uh -huh. it. Doesn't look too golden, though. Not too bad. Uh -huh. Is it Need cooked cook all the way more? through? I think we should cook it some more. Okay. They're kind of like uh, pie crust. But boy, does that taste good right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I'm going to insist on a cowboy coming in every course I ever go on. This is, this is the finished product. Yum. Go ahead and eat it, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> Better than Dunkin' Donuts, I tell you that. One of the effects of the strange diet we'd been eating was to create gaseous havoc in our intestines. At the fire, Joe decided to share his gas with us. We're all lucky he wasn't just a touch closer to the fire. Do that around me, either I'll light your ass on fire. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine, if you will, looking up at the stars and calculating the actual time to within about 15 minutes. If you pay close attention to the following mini lecture, you'll be able to do it. Throughout the description that follows, you'll need to remember that I've chosen a couple of dates at random and that the position of the stars in the graphics was also chosen at random. All you need to do is to remember the formula and go outside to do the calculation. It will work. One of the gee whiz techniques we like to show students is how to tell time by the Big Dipper. What we've done here is we've taken a giant clock and placed it in the sky with Polaris and to the left of the screen you can see the Big Dipper. The pointer stars on the Big Dipper of course point at Polaris. Down to the lower right there, you're going to see the constellation of Cassiopeia. Now there are two pointer stars on the Big Dipper. The pointer stars, of course, point at the North Star, and Cassiopeia uses the center star to kind of point the direction to the North Star. Now if you draw a line from the North Star through the pointer stars beyond the Big Dipper, you can see that it indicates about 8.30 on the clock by the Big Dipper, or on Cassiopeia, the hour hand points at about 3.30. With that information in hand, let's learn how to tell time by the stars. The first thing you need to know is that on March 7th at midnight, the pointer stars of the Big Dipper are directly above the North Star. Now let's pretend that today's date is June 7th and this is the position of the Big Dipper in the sky. Let's calculate the time. Now we're going to do some scary math. First of all, we have to know the number of months past March 7th, and we know that's going to be three months in our new formula. The hour hand reading on the sky is going to be, well, what did we say? Oh yeah, it's 8.30 on the big sky clock. So we've got three months since uh, March 7th and 8.30. Now all we've got to do is add those two numbers, three plus eight and a half, that gives us 11.5. 11.5 multiplied by 2 gives us 23. You subtract 23 from 24 and it's 1 a.m. in the morning on that example. Now let's try a different one for September 21st. Now what we've got is six and a half months since the March 7th date. So we're going to take that six and a half months add it to 8.5 on the Big Dipper clock and we get 15. 15 times 2 is going to give us a funny number. 30. Well you can't subtract 30 from 24 so we make the 24 into a 48. We subtract it, we get 18 and that's 1800 hours. What if it's daylight savings time? Well just add one hour to your calculated time. Simple as that. Hey. What if you can't see the Big Dipper? You can only see Cassiopeia. Well, just add another five hours to it. So, the number of months past March 7th, the hour hand reading to Cassiopeia, plus five. There you have it. This formula is worthless if you don't try it out. Remember, too, that you'll need to learn to estimate the time on the Big Dipper clock accurately. 
An error in estimating the big clock time is the most common way to induce an inaccuracy. I find it helps to drop a plumb line down across the North Star and then estimate the time based on the line that tells me 12 and 6. You can also make up a graphic on paper or cardboard that will give you some much more accurate time telling. As a final resort, you can use a concave lens from an old pair of binoculars to shrink the view of the sky. The more you make the sky look like the clock on the wall, the more easily you'll be able to tell the time accurately. Remember that once you can estimate the time accurately on the big time and make the correct adjustment in months and weeks, you can easily be within 15 minutes of the correct time. Finally, sometimes a star clock and local time will read the same. Don't let that fool you. The big clock runs counterclockwise. That sort of makes me wonder why we make clocks run in the direction they do. Hmm. Hi, I'm going to make a road in the sun today. It's a nice day. Uh, here's some of the materials that we're gathering. Some uh, pine. And what we're going to do is uh, set it up right here on this sandy beach. And then uh, we're going to come over here and we're going to dig out this pond a little bit, clean it up, and let the water flow into this. And this is going to be our uh, dunking pool. Building a sauna is a cooperative effort. Everyone who wants to use it must make some contribution to the construction. Some of the folks gathered stones, some cut the support members or gathered firewood. Others offered up their precious plastic. In the end, it would end up being a pleasure for all. This is our uh, waiting pool, and what we've done here is uh, blocked off the stream so it comes into the waiting pool and helps pull out the sediment. This is where once we get out of the sauna, we'll come in here and take a nice cool bath. What we've got here are the rocks that we're going to use for our sauna. And as you can see, I've taken rocks and I've placed them in a close proximity to one another. And actually some of them are inside the fire. And I've started a fire on top of them. What this is going to do is this is going to heat up our rocks um, for the sauna. We'll roll the rocks into our sauna bed when we, um, when we get it covered. And that's what we're going to be putting our water on and our aromic, aromatic um, uh, vegetation. One thing I do want to point out is that these stones are not stream stones. Stream stones are, are any kind of stone that is near a stream is the kind of stone you do not want to use because they might have some residual moisture inside of them and when they get hot, because we do have to do this for two hours minimum to get these rocks hot enough, they might explode. So be sure not to use stream stones. We got these way up on the mountain here. It was quite a quite a trek but we got them here so we're gonna let this it's been going for about an hour we're gonna let it go for another hour and then anytime after that we're ready to go I want to make sure you'll have enough before I do my side there we'll put we'll put like a cut like three rocks here and then we'll see if the other side is cool well, we put our plastic sheet on top of this lodge pole and it looks like it's not hitting equally on both sides. It's not long enough. So what we're going to do is we have to lower this lodge pole, which is the center pole right here that goes all the way across. And all we're going to do is move these out a little further on both sides. Whoops. Not that much. What we're going to do now, since we've lowered these, is we're going to take our shovel, a shovel that we found up here in a stash when we came into camp, which was pretty fortunate for us. We're going to take the shovel and we're going to take uh, sand and secure these with sand. Okay. So when we're inside, it's not going to fall on us for some weird reason. I'm moving dirt here onto the edge of the 
tent to uh, hold down the sides. Okay, what I'm doing now is I am taking sand and putting it on the outside of here. After I have sufficient sand, what I'm going to do is come over and pull this out. Make it as, as much space inside as I can. There are a few holes in this. This is something we have been using for a, a shelter. But just for the day, we're going to be using this um, on our sauna. It is okay if you have a few holes. If you have some big holes, it's not a good idea to use these because the, the heat will escape from it. And we'll do the same thing to the other side. Right here, what we've done is dug out this little bit of a hole here because when the rocks get hot, we're going to roll them over and roll them underneath the plastic and into the inside so the person on the inside can stack them up and heat up the inside. And then right over here, there's going to be a door so that when we enter and exit, it's away from the hot coals that'll be rolling over this way here. And then we'll take off and go jump in the pool, cool off. We have another sheet of plastic here that's a little too big to fit in this in this space and we want to save half of it for another use we might need out here in the wilderness. So we're gonna what we've done is is we've halved it right here and we're just gonna cut it. And that's gonna seal up the back side here. I've cut about a dozen uh, one foot or so um, parachute cord pieces of parachute cord and what we're doing now is we're attaching this piece of plastic to the back and this is how we're doing it. We're folding it over and we're just punching holes with our knife and then we just put that through and tie it. There you go. Let's go ahead and put this through. There you. Okay, now you can see how this is tying to it. I did these a little closer together so you could see what it was going to turn out to look like, but we're going to do them a little, a little further apart when we get down to the bottom here. As you can see, Jim is taking some sand and he's closing off the bottom now that we have tied this piece of plastic to the end and sealed it up completely. Now we'll go on to the front of the sauna and make the door. This is the door side of the sauna, and as you can see, uh, Jim tied it all the way down on one side, and this is the side on my side is going to be opening. I just tied one here, and I have a clip that's removable. This is how we're going to get into the sauna. Someone out here who's taking care of moving the rocks is going to be out here to close it back up. And what we'll do is we'll take the hot rocks and with some sticks, move them down here. Open this up. Jim, Jim uh, dug this hole. They'll take it in and and they'll get sonified. These are three essential things you're going to need when you get inside of your sauna. You're going to need a, a pair of tongs. When they move the hot rock into the inside of the sauna, you're going to need these tongs to move it to the area in the sauna you want best because you're definitely not going to want to touch it with your hands. It will burn you. You're going to need something aromatic. We have pine around here. This is a wonderful smelling pine. What we're going to do is set this on top of the hot rock and we're going to use this rock, which is the third item, to smash and let the aromatic smells come out of it. And on top of that, you will need, whoops, we need one more thing, which is this. This will be filled with water inside of the sauna. And when you get the hot rock in there, you'll put the aromatics on it, you'll smash it with the rock, and then you'll put water on top of it and when the steam starts coming up from the hot rock it will smell like pine. You can also take this pine and rub it in between your hands and put it on your body as a cleansing agent. Now there's something else I wanted to show you and that is our door here. We had an extra um, sheet of plastic and we put that on the ground here. This is what we're going to be sitting on. So we'll just get inside and We'll wait for the rock to be, to be passed underneath here. We'll use our tongs to move it, our aromatic to put on top of it, smash it, rub it, clean yourself. You stay in here until you're red hot, and then we're going to run out and get into that cold water, and it's going to feel so good.
I feel refreshed. <laughs> Woo! Yes. What do you think? I feel great. That was wonderful. It's invigorating, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Oh, God. It's nice. It's a little chilly. Ah! Hi, I'm Bill. A couple of us have been practicing our trapping skills here this week, and uh, you'll notice behind me we have a nice flat meadow, and we found a ground squirrel colony there. Now, the reason we're working the ground squirrels is, well, there are no marmots. Ground squirrels live where the marmots don't. So you don't have to travel all the way to the high Sierras just to practice your skills. Second thing is, when you do find a colony, there's usually quite a number of squirrels, and it maximizes your chances of uh, being successful. And the third thing is, they taste really good. So let's go over and take a look and see what we've done. You may not be able to see it, but there are holes all around us here. And most of these holes are interconnected. Um, but not all the holes may be active. So the best way to decide where to set your traps, because you don't want to set them in every hole that, that's around, is to stay outside the colony for a little bit and watch until you see some animals. You see one go down in a hole, you go to that hole, and you set your trap. It's pretty simple. Last night when I found these, uh, there was no activity. So what I did is I made some little uh, activity sticks, and I cut off a piece of um, pine branch, it's the very tip actually, and uh, cut it so that it would uh, kind of stand up. And what we're going to do is set this in the hole, right in the middle. And when an animal is going to come out, it'll knock out a side. I can come back the next day or a couple hours, and I decide, okay, I have activity in this hole. This is where I'm going to set my snare. And I've made one up here. Now, I'm not going to go over the construction of the snare because you can see that in Volume 5 of the Woodsmaster series. But we did find a few pointers that we think is worth passing on to you. First of all, if you set your snare stake off to the side, when the animal comes out, there's a lot of slack, and it'll just push the noose aside until it can get, get free. What you need to do is pull all the slack out, set your noose, pull all the slack out, and put your stake in back here. Then when the animal comes out, it starts to tighten the noose immediately. Okay, here's the stake that I tied the wire off to. Just a simple twist. Uh, it's about a foot and a half from the hole. You can see the uh, taut wire here going down to the hole. When I first walked up, this dirt was freshly disturbed. It was much darker, just like this. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, could see a bit of the tail at that time. We're going to take him out now. He's pulling on the stake right on the stick right now a little bit. Man, it's in there. You need, some, need some help digging it out? It's in there. Need some help? Go ahead and use anaconda here. Here we go. He just pulled on this stick. He's under a rock right here. Oh boy, he pulled. Yeah, he will. You gotta keep holding. I can see why you use tight or uh, strong, strong wire. Yeah. A lighter wire, and it'd be, it'd be gone already. Yeah. There we go. Yeah.
Wow, this ew, booger's in here, honey. That's getting pretty solid in here. Where'd the hole go? Yeah, we got yeah, you got some fit. Yeah, I got some, right there. Got some hair. Yeah, we got a tail. I had no idea these things are so strong. Oh, well, he's dug in like an alligator in here, man. There's like feet and legs. The wire. And he's stuck in the ground. And we probably got him around the waist. Oh, right, you lift him up. There we go. Nice one. Yeah. Nice. No, 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 no. Back, back, back. Can you get a picture of that, Steve? Get back, get back. I just use your last. Oh, nuts! <laughs> <laughs> nice one. How are you guys doing? Thank you. <laughs> hey Ron, how you doing? Yeah, how you doing, Woo! Woo! You see him smile that much on the whole trip. You guys all ready to go home now? Yeah, we're yeah, ready. Did you have fun? Oh, I had a great time. Good. I had a great time. Feet hurt, but uh, yeah. we're ready to have some burgers and uh, brews. All right. What about you, Tom Cruise? Oh, it was fabulous. It was a great trip. Awesome. Really happy. So, Eric, did you have fun? I had a blast. Great. Cool. What'd you like the best out of it? Everything. Yeah? Just everything added up. All and right. The whole, the whole package is great. All right. What about you, Joe? As Eric said, it was just a total blast. Do it again in a heartbeat. Right on. Just give me another year or so. <laughs> That's funny. Here comes Wally. <laughs> you know what? No. Hey, how's it going? Hey, did you have fun? I had a great time, as a matter of fact. Yeah? You know what? First soda and overweight. Oh. Mm. How does it taste? Heavenly. I think I'll do this again. All right. <laughs> hey, Rachel. Did you have fun? Oh, yeah. yeah. What did you like the best? Best. The sauna? Yeah, probably the sauna. It was fun. <laughs> hey, you guys. Did you have fun? Bill, did you have a great time or what? Did you? What was your favorite part? Uh, swimming and, and catching a squirrel for the first time. First time with snares. That was pretty awesome, wasn't yeah, it? I've never done any snaring before, so that was the best part. Yeah? Did it taste good? Yeah, it did. It's a little chewy, but it was, uh, uh, I don't know if it's as good as rat, only you could tell me that. <laughs> cool. Hey Rick, you're on, baby. Hi. Hey, did you have fun? I had a great trip. Cool. What was your favorite part? Catching the fish. Catching that fish that night. That fish was really tasty, wasn't it? Yeah. Wasn't that just the it best tasting taste fish? You missed the funny part, though. And no, I did. Bill, I pulled that fish out of there and I hooked it. First one. Uh huh. And I hooked the second one and I yelled, "What do I do?" <laughs> <laughs> And I got it up on the bank and it came off the hook. Ooh. And then Bill dived into the, the side of the bank and so did I. And it was pretty fun. Oh, but you, but fun. you finally got it, didn't you? Yep. And the fish almost won. We both almost went in. <laughs> <laughs> we would have gone right in for it. Right. Oh, that's great. <laughs> and it would have been worth it. Been pretty young. How you doing, Steve? It's fine. Does it feel good to be back without your pack on? Yeah, it feels good. Yeah? Did you have fun? I did. Good. What was your favorite part? Oh, boy. I don't know. I just like being out there. It's just a great country and good time. Good. Glad you had fun. Yeah, I did. Hey, Rob. How's it going? Good. How you doing, cowboy? I'm peachy. Look at that face, everybody. Isn't that just <laughs> the know, best cowboy? You know what peachy is. You know, it's a little fuzzy on the outside. <laughs> sweet right under that with a hard little rough core. Ah, oh, that, that's what that that's is. peachy. Right on. Good explanation. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. Oh, come on, I didn't see Jim, <laughs> did you have fun? Lots of fun. Yeah? yeah? What was your favorite part? Um, probably the sauna. The sauna? That was super fun, wasn't it? But we st we need another bath today, don't we? A couple, yeah. probably. Yeah, <laughs> I think at least. Yeah, <laughs> oh, Good sign. Wally, you made it! Another one. Oh, how you doing, buddy? I'm tired. Are you? Yeah. Yeah? Did you have fun? Yeah, it was a great trip. Oh, good. I'm glad. What was your favorite part? I think uh, doing the skills around that uh, first base camp. 
That was fun. Kind of watching the you know the Forge stuff, yeah. Eric's Forge, and mm -hmm. and uh, oh, yeah. the Bellows system that Ray set up. That was just that was great, song. wasn't it? So it just kind of you know opened my eyes to what you could do. If, yeah, you show a little imagination and find a, you know a few treasures out in the woods. Yeah, absolutely, awesome. Thanks, Wally. Your belly scratched, I'll bet, huh? Look at that dog. He's so tired. Look at that dog. Pretty good. Yeah? Yeah. Did you have fun? Had a great time. Awesome. What was great your favorite group of part? Great people. It was, huh? Great group of people. <laughs> Laughed. We uh, fished. We uh, trapped. Uh, we played around with mucusy things. We dug ugly, rotten stuff out and ate it. Um, yeah, it couldn't have been better. <laughs> <laughs> How'd you like the trip? I love the trip. These people are just wonderful. I had such a fun time meeting all these people and having fun with them. And, and my favorite part was getting a big old sauna. That sauna felt so good yesterday. Oh man, I tell you what. Yep, it was good. Anything yep. else? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. I, I think I just want to go back and get a really hot, hot um, bath and consume mass quantities of fat. Done deal. <laughs> This is a crossbow that I made, or I don't know, it's some kind of um, silicone tubing bow. And what this is is a arrow. It holds the arrow down, and it's just a branch with a Y that I make it into like a teeter totter. And there's a little string through this top of it that goes down underneath the part that hits the uh, the bolt. So I just tied around here. It's really quick to do. And if I lift this, if I push down on here, it'll lift the string up and let the rubber band go. Like that. So you can see the, the piece comes back and just tucks underneath there. And it holds it into this notch. And then it releases it when you pick it up th past the notch.